Hello, and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And ideally in virtual legality, what we're doing is informing and educating folks about how business and law works in the real world. And what better way to do that than actually asking someone who recently performed their civic re responsibility on a jury, and that happens to be, as of today, my wife. So let's bring her on and let's talk a little bit about that jury experience. Hi, honey. How are you doing? Hey, hi. I am so glad to have you here and thank you so much for taking the time to do this video. I think the jury responsibility, the jury experience is so important and a lot of people find it to be mysterious. And I know I do because I'm very unlikely to ever serve on a jury due to my background in law and talking about things on YouTube. So thank you for being here. How were you informed of your jury call and what were the things that ran through your head when you got that jury notice? Well, I think <clears throat> I think my response was the same most people have, which is, oh man, really? Uh, <laughs> so uh, I got a summons, it's an official court summons in the mail informing me where I had to show up, what time, which was at the most ridiculous hour and, uh, and what date. And <clears throat> We do have the opportunity to delay our service if we need to, like if you're on vacation, right? And you, there's no, you're not going to move your whole trip because you've got to show up. But uh, this was both the best and worst case scenario for me because it was, it happened to be over spring break, which yes, is we not, were on vacation, just not but, real vacation. Right, we weren't taking a trip. It was not convenient by any means because. The kids were off school and I would love to be spending that time with them. And we had a whole bunch of stuff planned, but also it was kind of the most convenient time because I didn't have to worry about getting them to and from school. Were they doing their homework? Who's going to feed them dinner? Who's going to make them lunch? Because uh, I love you, but that's a lot to manage. So it was I a decided, new experience that week. Yes. Yeah, um, I decided but... to just, I just kept my time. So, and of course, everyone in my life told me, you're probably not even going to get called into the room. Yeah, including your husband, right? Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of voir dire, as we get fancy in Latin here, can you walk me through the process of jury selection for this case? What was that like? What were the law lawyers focused on in getting a fair and impartial jury, as is their responsibility? Sure. So the first thing I want to say is that particular day at the courthouse, they had the maximum number of jurors that they could call. They had a lot of cases going on, and the room that they start you in was packed. And I know for some people, like the toughest thing for me about jury duty is that big unknown, right? Am I going to end up on a case? How long am I going to be here? What is this process going to be like? Where am I going to park? Like, I, I feel like there's a couple things that are really difficult about jury duty and they're not what you think. This is one of them is just not knowing how any of that's going to go. So the, the folks who run the jury like assembly room, I don't know what to call it. Uh, it's room 100, uh, were <laughs> wonderful. They were wonderful. And they were really trying to make it, they had a great sense of humor. They were very friendly. They were trying to make it as easy and clear to understand as possible. And they were so, I felt like just so great. They were like, if anybody parked on this street, you're going to get towed. If anybody parked over here, you need to go move your car. Come up here. We're going to give you a map. We'll show you where to park. They were very, they were very, very encouraging. Like, we know you don't want to be here, but we're going to try to help you as much as possible. Here's where you should go have lunch. Here's, you know, <laughs> ask us if you have any questions. It was, that part of it was really lovely. Oh, good. So I felt like that was, that was easy. So now when you say there are a lot of jurors, how many people are we talking about there? So that was 300 people. Wow. Not for my own, like just for this case, but there were 300 people there that day. So they called us, um, they called about 40 people to the room for our case and started by seating uh, 14 people. Yeah. Started meaning, by seating. meaning they they started with just picking 14 folks and saying, you're the jury until we find out you're not. Exactly. They randomly selected 14 people. I was the seventh person chosen. So there was, I mean, honestly, in my gut, I knew there was like no way I was going home. <laughs> I just, I figured who's not going to pick the nice white suburban mom to be on a jury. So uh, I was the seventh person picked. So the, the first thing the judge said 
they do a lot of like rah rah. It's your civic duty, you know. Thanks for being here, kind of thing. And doing? then, and then they asked. Um, he did tell us right away that it was a murder case. This was a murder trial, and he gave us an idea of how long we would be there. He said, you know, probably Thursday at the latest, which was accurate. He said Wednesday if we're lucky, but Thursday at the latest, and that's what ended up happening. So which is we the were same week that you started. It was a, it was a week long. It was a Monday, yeah. So we were committing to at least four days, right? Um, and he asked if, you know, then there's sort of like a general, some general questions of can we, you know, kick anybody for these reasons? Do you know one of the lawyers? Do you know the defendant? Do you um, have a, a compelling medical reason you can't be here? And this judge was very nice to the young mom who had young children and he dismissed her uh, because she needed to go home and be with her kids. Not all judges would do that. And then he asked some questions about uh, our, then we, he asked us, everyone who was seated, the, the 14 people seated were asked questions about their background, uh, what they do for a living, what their spouse does for a living, whether they're married or not, whether they have children. And those were pretty general, but right away you could tell there were people who work for the police department. They got sent home. If you've been on a murder trial before you got, and actually let me be clear. You did not get sent home. You actually got sent downstairs to wait again because Back they could the send you. Yeah. They could send you back to another courtroom later that day if they needed more jurors. What surprised me was how many jurors they went through because by the time we were done, there were maybe only 10 or 12 people left in that room. So we went through a lot of people to narrow this down, but there were some obvious. And then, so after, let me back up. After the judge asks these kind of general questions, he opened it up to the attorneys to ask us some questions. And this is where you kind of got a little more of a feel for what the case might be about or what they might try to argue because they started asking specific questions about our feelings about um, gun ownership. Do we have any gun violence in our background? Um, has that affected our life in any way? And um, the defense attorney got up and he talked to me first, which was horrifying. I'm like a deer in headlights while I'm sitting there. And he asks this like long meandering question. I don't even remember what it was. And I'm for you. There, oh my gosh, I'm sitting there looking at him and I'm like, what answer are you looking for? That wasn't even really. A, and by the time I get to the point where I'm like, I should ask him what sort of clarification he's looking for. He simplified his questioning. So he simplified his questioning down to what, um, you know, do I believe people should have guns? I mean, it's, it's in the constitution, sir. And do I have guns at home? So there were some like really specific questions about how we felt about those things. Um, and there were some obvious people that got let go. People work for the police department, the kid who's getting ready to go to the police academy. Um, just some obvious things. Some people, somebody had served on a, on a jury before a murder trial before. And so they got sent. So as they were starting to narrow it down that, you know, they're arguing over specific people. And at, at one point the prosecutor had dismissed, like, I don't know, his 12th person or something. And I see the defense attorney throw his pencil down on the table. There were two attorneys at that table with the defendant and the other one stands up. She's like, yes, uh, judge, I think we need to have a, I think we need to talk here. I don't think this is a conversation to have in front of the jury, but um, I, we need to talk about what's happening here. And the judge says, I agree. And so they all go back and he tells the juror that was about to be dismissed to stay there. They all go back to chambers. When they come back, he's like, this is our jury. <laughs> so that was it. And <clears throat> there we were. But that process that I just described to you took like four hours. It was very lengthy. And at, at some point I'm like, do we, do we really have to, can we move this along? I, that was my thought a lot of the time. Like, okay, we all get it. Can we, can we move on? The so and I know in a yeah, later, later during deliberations, many of the jurors were like, this 
took way too long. This took much longer than it should have. So I was not the only one thinking that. Well, so you mentioned gun ownership. You mentioned experiences of gun violence. You had an inkling at that point because you knew you were on a murder case, what this would involve. Uh, but the joke that lawyers have is that we'd never be picked for a jury because we, quote unquote, know too much. And there'd be a concern that other juries would defer to our possibly biased, as for any human being, judgment. Apparently married to a lawyer who comments on legal matters and sometimes trials and makes videos like this one was not enough of a concern to keep you off the case. So that didn't come up? I don't know that. Well, okay. So the first thing is <laughs> you're a corporate attorney. Okay. So like no one cares. We joke you. that you're you're a useless lawyer, right? Because you can't get people out of jail. You can't write somebody's will. You can't help them with the divorce, right? But like- I can so, keep people out of jail. <laughs> you keep Once people you're out there, of jail. I need to send you to someone else. Yeah. So um, so in I guess in my mind, I had already sort of written this off as like, I can't play the lawyer card because <laughs> the one thing the judge did emphasize actually was um, court is not like law and order. Like actual cases are not like television. And if you love watching that stuff, do you think you can set that knowledge aside to decide this case? And there was actually a lot of emphasis on can you, is is X, Y, Z thing in your life going to impact your decision or can you set that aside? Whether it was a bias, whether it was a, a even a, even a bias about like what the defendant does for a living or a bias against lawyers or judges or, um, you know, you've watched too much TV. Are you expecting too much? You know, can can you reasonably come to a conclusion based on the facts in this case? And that was the one thing that both attorneys talked about repeatedly during voir dire is like, this is about facts. That is the you job. Like yeah. Me yeah, you can like me or not like me. This is about facts. And the judge is like, I may, uh, you know, sustain objections and this should have no bearing on your decision. There was a lot of talking about this is only about facts and the like theater of the courtroom should have no impact on your decision. So I, I, I didn't even really, he asked, this was stupid and I made this mistake, but he asked if anyone had uh, knew anyone in law or law enforcement. And in my mind, mine was like, oh yeah, like police, sheriff, highway patrol. I did not equate that to lawyer. So I didn't speak up. And um, so when they asked me your profession, I know I made a lot of mistakes, y'all. Um, when they asked me your profession, there's like an audible gasp from the room when I say that you're an attorney. And I'm like, he's a corporate attorney, you guys. Like in my... And, and the, and the judge is like, you didn't think to say anything when I said law or law enforcement. And I'm like, oh yeah, I guess in my mind, I just didn't put that together. And the defense attorney, thank goodness says, well, you didn't specifically say lawyer. <laughs> so I was like, okay, good. I'm glad we're all on the same page here because I didn't really. So then when he said, did anyone else not say anything? Like five other people raised their hand that they know lawyers or have someone in their life who's a lawyer. So. We're everywhere. I think, I, I think, but I think the question is not very clear. Okay. Anyway. So no, no, I, I think it's a good answer. I'm sorry. I got you in trouble. <laughs> so it was, well, I was trying not to say too much. It is kind of a really, I found it sort of awkward. Like I'm going to have to stand, like if I have a medical situation and I need to, I have to stand up in front of this room. Well, I don't have to stand up, but like in front of a room full of like 60 people, I don't know. I have to tell you my medical situation. There's parts of that, that I felt like were really uncomfortable, like personally to, so I was trying not to say too much, but how do I explain us? How do I explain what we are and what you do and what this is? I mean, this doesn't, nobody knows what I do. Nobody knows. So, um, so it did not get me, kicked off the jury. And quite frankly, in talking with the jury, there was someone who served as a witness for a domestic violence case. So she knew a lot about how this process was going to go. And hmm. she was referring to that when we were in the room. So I don't think there was any like, oh, we're going to defer to Mrs. Hogla because she, you know, she, her husband's in it. There wasn't any of that at all. It was not her I, real name, by the way, folks. 
<laughs> yeah, I remained very quiet anyway. In I was, I didn't, I didn't want to accidentally say something in the jury room that would be misconstrued. I didn't want to cause a problem. So I just read a book. Every break we had, I read a book. So <laughs> I got halfway through The Hobbit. If that gives you any idea of how much time we were waiting. Um. So I yeah. So that's. I don't think that that colored that at all. I mean, I was just I curious because honestly, when I sent you off to the pool, one of the things I know I said to you was they're never going to impanel you because you just look at your relationship to me and they say, we don't want anybody that spent that much time doing trial broadcasts or otherwise talking with other lawyers. And I'm intrigued by what they're doing in voir dire now, because it seems to me like in 2024, one of those questions should not just be law and order. It should be how much time do you spend watching law tubers? How much time do you spend taking in Emily D. Baker or Legal Bites or to a lesser extent, virtual legality? And so <clears throat> lawyers aren't there yet because lawyers are slow on tech. That's just true. Yeah. And I think so this judge was actually a retired judge who was filling in for a judge that was on medical leave. And several times throughout the trial, he made a joke about where are the millennials in the room? We need them to figure out this tech because they were trying to connect up to the TV to show evidence, et cetera. And which one of the jurors was like, every time he says that, it is so offensive. <laughs> um, and I, so I think like for, for him, I mean, his law show reference is law and order. Like how, I mean, so I don't think. That's what I use. I mean, and, and all the and all the attorneys in that room, everyone, everyone, the judge and the attorneys in that room were much older than I was. So I think that that YouTube law tube and all of that kind of thing, that's not on their mind. But I do think we'll that. Yeah, I mean, I do think that's a question that that should be asked. But I again, I sort of lump that under media. Are you watching TV? Do you watch trials? Do you follow things like this? Can you set aside that knowledge to analyze the facts? There are people in my friend circle that would take great offense to being called media. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> my massive apologies. Oh, no, not at all. So you get through voir dire. I, I get the text from you that says rip spring break. <laughs> uh, so you're impaneled. How do you feel that that point about the responsibility before you? I think you have opening statements that are given to you that day, right? We hear opening statements from the prosecutor and then the defense reserves his time and then they send us all home. Hmm. Um, there's part of me that's relieved because I know this is what I'm doing, right? This is what I'm going to be doing the next couple of days. There's no question mark for my week. I know what's happening. So in terms there's of stress, of me, points, the ambiguity was what was really getting to you. It really was, right? The un and that's the thing that I think is is difficult about jury duty. And I think that's kind of what like makes your heart sink into your stomach is like this, just this big, massive unknown for your life at that point when that letter comes in the mail. And you know how anxious I was leading up to it because not only do I take this very, very seriously and I was not prepared for... I don't want to like overplay this, but like the emotional and mental weight that came with making a decision like this. And this was not, this isn't a death penalty case. This wasn't anything like that. It, it wasn't, there wasn't a racial component to it. There, there wasn't, uh, it, I didn't have to see a lot of like horrendous pictures of anything. Um, it was, the decision I, well, I don't want to get ahead of myself. So, I, but <laughs> I, it was still a serious thing. And it was still, so there was some relief because the uncertainty had been settled, but now there was also this great weight that I was carrying. And I, I took this process very seriously. I guess I, I will leave it at that. I know you did. And I knew that you would, but you have a lot of other people now in the room with you having discussions that are also in the same role as you. How long did it take you all to get into the rhythm of trial, to feel comfortable with how cases are actually presented in real life and to converse and be around each other? 
we this was a fairly quiet jury. They um we didn't talk uh very like even just like casually when we were in the room. Well, so that leads into my next question, which is I would note for folks that we are doing this video well after the trial concluded, because as per the court's direction and for any juror, they get the same direction. You refuse to tell me anything about the trial until after your service was complete. You'd come home every day. You wouldn't say anything about what you'd done all day. Uh, and then you would get up the next morning and go back to trial. Was it your impression that the rest of the jury was taking its responsibilities as seriously as you were? Yeah, this was a really intelligent group of people. Um, and while we weren't, I did go to lunch with a couple of the jurors one day and we all talked about their jobs and stuff. And um, they were really good about not talking about the case. Uh, but it was really awkward to be in a room of people you don't know, right? And and not really knowing. I think the you know one of the hard things is you don't really know where anybody else is at. So, and that was difficult for me because usually I discuss things like this with you and I sort of check my positions against you and we kind of debate them so that I can make sure I'm coming to the best right answer and to not be able to do that was really hard. I don't think cases should last very long because it's really hard to not talk about things for Did a, they explain a, to you why you don't talk about things that you want the whole picture of the evidence before you get into deliberations or discussions with your peers? They, did they actually did about that. They actually didn't discuss that at all. Hmm. Um, and it was, <clears throat> I had to keep checking in with myself because I feel like my mind was made up very early. And, but I had to keep checking in with myself to say, hey, there's, we need to make sure we listen to everything here. And, weigh everything that's here and not just, and not require more because of the answer we might want, right? Like there's an answer I might want that's correct, that I might want to be correct. And so I didn't want to put, I, I wanted to be able to weigh everything evenly as opposed to saying that doesn't get me to my correct answer. So I don't know if I want to believe that, right? Like you don't want to prejudge. That's what, right. And you, did you know, because I said to you, I'm really wrestling and having a hard time. And I think some of, I think most of what that was is that by the end, I knew what was right in my heart. And I was worried that I would have to argue for my side. That's what and you described was, to me. You didn't tell me any details, but you did say you were concerned that it would become a fight. You didn't want to be in 12 angry men all of a sudden. Yeah, and I can't yeah. blame you for that. Now, we've talked around it a lot, uh, and I know we didn't want to get into the details yet. We're going to talk a little bit more about the case before you specifically now. Certainly, my intent is not to draw out details of the parties, the incident, or your deliberations or other jurors, especially if you don't feel comfortable sharing those. So please keep your answers as high level as you want. But in a few words, what was the case before you, and what was the primary issue facing the jury? Sure. Um, this was... This was interesting. Every case has nuance, right? And so that was kind of that was kind of fun. And and honestly, after I had the after all of the lawyers had kind of danced around the issues before they impaneled the final jury, I'm like, well, now I need to know what happened. Like now, now I'm so curious. I need to stay. You have I better be on this jury now because I gotta know what what happened. I gotta find out. So this was um this, it, this was actually a self-defense case. So we all agree. And there is a video of the incident. There is security footage of the complete incident. So there is no question. We all agree right away that the defendant had a gun, that it, that it was the cause of death uh, for the deceased, that there was a killing that happened. And so at that point, the question becomes, was this self-defense or not? And so that's what we spent a lot of time talking about. Was it self-defense? What do we know about the relationship between these two people? It, they were two cousins. Um, like I said, there was no racial component to this. And they it wasn't... 
it wasn't drug related. The, the defendant had a concealed pistol license. Like everything was like, you know, owning the gun was legitimate. All of that was all on the level. Um, so it was at that point became for us to determine whether the, you know, what the defendant's state of mind was. And they ended up putting him on the stand so that we could hear from him. There were two eyewitnesses, one of which the jury determined was not very reliable because they didn't actually really see anything. Um, the only thing that raises a little bit of a red flag for me, because I try to see, I, I try to see all sides of things. All of the witnesses are people who either work for the defendant or are family members of the defendant. So there, there to me could be a little bit of, of bias. This didn't seem to impact the jury at all. They took every testimony as honest and true. So there wasn't, there wasn't, uh, that didn't raise any questions for anybody in the jury. And, um, and what else did I want to say? Oh, and then of course, what, what comes up when you're talking about that is what is the state of mind of the defendant? Did they have reason to believe they were in, you know, extreme eminent danger or potential death? Uh, from the deceased. And the video, while there's no audio, clearly shows an agitated, worked up individual who gets aggressive. And the biggest piece of evidence for the jury, and for myself, I guess, I didn't really need this piece. I, I saw enough there to be convincing for me, is that the uh, the deceased had a history of extremely violent behavior had done time for a, a murder in the past, has been known to carry a gun, has been known to pull a gun. And so all of that kind of together says he probably, you know, it's reasonable to expect this guy thought something terrible was going to happen. The defendant. Yeah. No, I, I think that's a, a good summary of, of what you have described to me in the past. Um, you said that that background, that history was important in the jury room. What was the most compelling piece of evidence to you? It sounds like it might have been the video. Yeah, I think it was the video. And it's really tough when you're in there because they're going to start and stop that video a bunch of times to show you specific things and to try to raise certain questions. And so we were allowed to view it in its totality without stopping in the jury room. And that was even though we had made a decision, everybody did want to see that video one more time. And we were able to just let it play in its, in its fullness. And that was actually rather revealing because it, we watched things in bits and pieces in the courtroom, but when we watched it together as a, a group, we could just let it play and realize how fast everything happens in this time frame. As, you know, this, as the story unfolds, it's very quick all of the things that happen. And then we also let it play because there's all the stuff that happens afterwards wasn't really discussed very much. So they let it play and they were kind of watching as the police arrive, as the emergency vehicles arrive, um, what is going on. We, we know who shows up from the family and what's going on. And so as we watch those people arrive, we can see um, kind of the interactions with the defendant. You know, that was very revealing. So there were just things in there to that, that to me was the clearest indication that this was, this was self-defense. Well, and, and it's perhaps a bit unusual, especially in the law and order side of things oh, yeah. for you to not have a dispute about the actual physical reality of what happened, right. but instead to be engaging with a legal question. Did you find the jury instructions for how to establish and interpret self-defense or any other affirmative defense that might've been before you easy to understand? Because that's, oh. that's part of the legal question that I always have yeah. is to communicate these difficult legal law school type class settings to hopefully people that can take it seriously, but can understand what's on the page in front of them. How did you find that experience? Oh yeah, that was really interesting. Um, I, I mean, I, I was, I, I was as much interested in what are the facts in this, you know, this heavy decision we had to make as much as like, what is happening in this process? You know, why is, why is this this way or whatever? And so it was interesting because for example, I'm going to answer your question, but I do want to say one thing. They <laughs> called the, um, 
they called the the coroner, right, who has looked at the body, has determined the cause of death and all of that. It's like, well, why do you do that? We can see on the video that that's clearly what happened. But when you look at if you're going to charge someone with, um, if you're going to charge someone with a murder, there's like three things they have to prove, right? And the first one is that, or one of them is that the deceased died because of the action of the defendant. So that had to be proven. So we were discussing that in the room. I'm like, well, we, you know, they're trying to cover all their bases because if we are going to convict him, they have to have met all of these burdens here. So that was really interesting. The judge read, the judge read us like, I don't know, 80 pages of transcript. It was yeah, just, and, and clearly like pages pulled from a notebook that are applicable to this case. And then they gave us this stack of papers in the, in the jury room. And there the are model was, jury instructions that the lawyers argue about. And then finally that package is read to a jury. Yes, the giant package of data. And it was like, could we, could we maybe like, we get it? <laughs> I don't know. It, closing arguments took less time than reading jury instruction. Um, but I did, I did think it was, it was really, I mean, it, you say a high level like law school decision, but in my mind, it was really cut and dry. It's like ABCD, if all these things are met, it's self defense. And so when we got back in that room, we pulled those papers out and looked at those criteria specifically. We read through them again. There were a couple of people that had some questions. So we passed that paper around. They read through them again to make sure they were satisfied with their determination. And that, you know, so I felt like it was very clear what we needed to do. And it was very clear what facts needed to be present to make that determination. But it was really interesting. And how long did it take you to reach that verdict? And were there any significant sticking points or individuals that were outliers that had to be convinced? It took us 20 seconds and we all agreed. Oh, well, that is honestly a, a heartening description of the justice system. We would hope that 12 reasonable individuals would come to a, <clears throat> would come to a reasoned decision of a similar stripe, but it is still nice to hear. Well, it was interesting to me. So our jury, our final like 12 that went in, it was 10 women and two men. And the women range in age from young people, young college age people to even people older than me and a good variety of people. I was the only like close to stay at home mom. I know I have jobs, but I was the only one who would be close to qualifying as a stay at home mom. Everybody else, you know, has some sort of career path and a wide variety of education, a wide variety of background, a wide variety of ethnicities. And I wondered if any of that was going to play into the decision. And I, I am really encouraged, Rick, really, really encouraged that 12 people who don't know each other, who did not talk about this, can go into a room and come to the same intelligent conclusion about what happened. All of us having so many different experiences in our life, having so many different um, backgrounds and, and family history that, that we can come in and we all, I mean, one of the jurors said, well, I guess they picked the right jury since we all came to the same conclusion. <laughs> and, and it really did feel that way that everyone had taken this very seriously that they recognize the gravity of this. Because even if this, there's, again, like I said, it's not, it wasn't a death penalty case, but this person would have gone to prison for a very, very, very long time. That's and serious. yeah, and it would have, it would have changed their life and the life of everyone around them forever. And that's serious. Um, sure. And on and, the other side of things, someone is dead and that's serious to yep, take into account as well. Abs absolutely. And, um, and we heard from the deceased mother his, his mother. And, and it is, was that hard? She really did not want to be there. Now I have to note too, that this incident took place in 2020. The, the legal system sad. rolls slowly. It's sad to me that we're four years later and this has been hanging over everybody's head for this long. She, she, I mean, 
she didn't want to be there. And it was a very emotional, she was there, the prosecution called her and it was a, a, a not an aggressive cross, but it was um, a very specific cross because they wanted to bring in the violent history of the deceased. And the jury did not like that the lawyer asked that question. Um, and it yet had it proved to be, to be important to them. Right. And it had to be asked. And I thought maybe they would hold that against the defense. They didn't. They didn't like him, but that didn't matter because they were really considering the facts. So I, um, I, 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 I thought that the jury did. I justice was definitely served and I thought the jury did an amazing job and, and um, I'm glad that we all agreed. So I did not have to argue my case because we did all agree. And you've probably guessed that we decided it was in fact self-defense. Yep. I was going to follow up on that, but yeah, you <laughs> found self-defense uh, in this murder case. You did it in, I think hyperbolically 20 seconds. No, um, it really but... was. No, Richard, it really was like, we went in the room. Yeah, Richard, folks. We're waiting for them to bring us um, the laptop with the video on it and some of the photo evidence. Not that we needed to see that for any reason. Um, although there was there was one one photo that comes up that had been admitted, but they don't show us till closing arguments. That was, I think, another like tipping point because a couple people said, "Oh yeah, once I saw that, like it totally makes sense." It was like, okay. So that was like, oh, I see. Defense kind of held that as like a surprise, but it wasn't really a surprise because it had been referenced several times. And then here's this photo. Um, we went in the room. We're waiting for this stuff. And everyone's just kind of sitting there. And I'm th my thought is, if we don't get this ball rolling, we're never going home. So I say, is there anyone who wants to be four person? Because... I, we need to move this process along in my mind. Like I'm going to throw this question out there. So whoever wants to can volunteer right now and we can just be done with this decision. And, and everyone course, just that's kind of volunteering. Looks at, yeah. Everyone looks at each other and no one wants to do it. So after a few minutes of everyone pointing at the teacher in the room and she's like, I don't know why everyone keeps looking at me. Um, and I say minutes, it was like a minute. Somebody says, well, how would we decide otherwise? And finally, I just, again, in, an effort to move this along said, if no one else wants to do it, I will do it. <laughs> Everyone's like, great. Sounds fantastic. I said, okay, well, if this is okay with everyone, we should just take a straw poll just, just to see where we're at. Okay. So I say, does anyone think he's guilty? And no one raises their hand. And we all look around and, and we're like, really, we all agree. And then we laugh and we're very excited because our decision has been made. We do decide to view the video and look through, someone raises a question about all the requirements for self-defense. I said, great, let's look at that and get your questions answered. And so we took care of that. But it was, that process even was 45 minutes and we were done. Well, I'm very proud of you because that takes that takes some chutzpah to go forward in front of a group of strangers and say, who wants to be four person? Especially knowing how social dynamics work and knowing that that means that you're the most likely to be four person. So... I'm glad you did it. I'm, I'm glad you experienced all this. I do want to back up a step and talk a little bit more about the formalities of jury duty because we do talk about juries and and how they think about things a lot in the trial watching space on the internet and otherwise. So one question that I had was, what do you do during breaks? You mentioned that you read The Hobbit uh, and were you frequently asked to leave the courtroom as we see in a lot of the public facing cases, right? When the lawyers and judge want to get together and they don't want the jury to overhear them. Sure. Um, so we were asked to arrive at nine, but we never got started before 10 because <laughs> the judge was handling other matters. You know, I don't like having my time wasted. That was frustrating. Well, and, um, and did that kind of irritate the jury at all? Did breaks or lawyering or judges maintaining control of their courtroom, did any of that impact? You said that you were taking your responsibilities seriously, but did you get any vibes of anybody getting irritated about how anybody in the professional capacity was operating in the courtroom? Oh, yeah. And these jurors were very upset that they had to pay for parking. That was That was humorous. That was a conversation every day. Where did you park? Was it cheaper than yesterday? Do you think they're just making up the price? I mean, that was the that was the general conversation. Um, we were not asked to leave the courtroom very often. I think only once um, the judge needed to discuss something. And 
uh, we, there was a waiting in the morning. And then usually when we came back from lunch, there might be some waiting. It always surprised me when they would call us back in from the jury room, which was so sad. There were two dead plants in there and it was just sad. <laughs> um, when they called us back in from the jury room, like they would just jump right in right away. No, like, welcome back. Hello. Nice to see you. Like, I'm waiting for that sort of like fluffy greeting. No, we're like, okay. And now we're calling another witness or whatever. So, and, and I think while people were frustrated with some of the process and listen, the prosecutor did his job. I don't believe that he dropped the ball or phoned it in in any way, but he was older. And so sometimes he would say, I don't, where is that on the video? Can you show me? And I pointed out that it could be a put on, like it could just be like a, I'm a bumbling. Or you know, country lawyer. Or country lawyer, right. I was like, I'm thinking my husband sometimes does that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like it could be a put on, but I, I don't think it was. I think like legitimately he just could not. He has trouble. Lawyers well, are human had, beings, folks. I know it's a surprise. Right. He had trouble. Yeah. He had trouble hearing. This was the other interesting thing in our courtroom, Rick. Um, so the court reporter is there, right? Oh, and also fascinating, like the court clerk is sitting there and people are coming in and out and talking to her during this case. It was so distracting. Uh, and the, the the deputy looked like he was asleep in the corner. That was quite humorous. Um, the court reporter is there. And so there is a microphone for all the witnesses, but it's not so we can all hear. It's so the court reporter can be capturing everything. So every time someone came up, the judge would say, you need to use your outside voice <laughs> because we were in a rather large room. So every, every time, and like, even the, even the lawyers would say, I can't, can, I can't hear. Can you speak up? Were you physically so, distant from the wist, from the witness stand then? We were probably only, you know, like two or three yards from the, from the witness stand, but like they were probably 15 feet they were a goodly distance. And then you have the, you know, the, the, do we call it the gallery? The people who are watching are, are even further than that. So it was a, a rather large room, but it was also like a really odd, like octagonal shape. Like it was a very weirdly shaped room. You and did mention anytime... that the background I'm using is too fancy for the room. Oh yeah. Way, too, way too fancy. Way too fancy. <laughs> It's fair. American. So corporate. yeah, there were, there were only a handful of moments where they needed to discuss things in chambers that happened a couple times. And we only got sent out of the room maybe once, uh, but there was a lot of waiting after lunch or when we had first arrived that we would, and this would judge like to take lunch at like 2 PM. We were all starving by the time he likes to take, he's on the Rick Hogue lunch schedule. He oh, likes getting to too much information out there about when I eat lunch. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Okay. That's true. <laughs> yeah. He was on the 2 PM lunch train. Well, it seems like everything went pretty smoothly, but looking back, is there anything that you wish you or the jury had done differently or that you wish you knew beforehand? Oh yes. So when I talk about the mistakes that I made, so I arrive at nine o'clock and it's really like nine Oh three because it's an ancient building and only one elevator is working, et cetera. And I'm not walking like the 20 flights of stairs to this floor. So when I get there, it's, it's, I'm late and I, I hate lateness. And so I go into the he courtroom. I, I'm not supposed to go into the courtroom. I'm supposed to wait because the deputy will find me outside because they're waiting for me. I was not the last one there, but I didn't know that it was not on the jury sheet. There's no sign on the door. That's like, do not enter, wait for deputy. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I didn't realize. And then, of course, in hindsight, I'm thinking, oh, yeah, sometimes before they bring the jury in, they're arguing motions and stuff. And I probably should have waited outside because I'm not supposed to see those things. So but I was not the only one who did that. And I was not the only one who got yelled at about it. And I don't mean yelled at like just the deputy was like, just wait for me outside next time. But it, I, I didn't. I really didn't know. And so and maybe all your viewers know that they're smarter than me, I guess. But I didn't I didn't realize that. So yeah, there were so I wish I had known that. I wish I had known um I I wish I had known 
I wish I had just been prepared for like the gravity of, of how, how heavy that process was going to feel because I just had to come home and like lay on the couch and watch garbage on TV because this was, and maybe it would feel different if it were a traffic case or a fraud case or something else. But like this, this was, this was really very serious and a, a packed, packed gallery. Um, there was like a lot of family involved in this whole incident. And I think every single one of them was in that room. So you said it, it was it, cousins, right? So yeah. 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 So it was very, and then it was uncomfortable, a little uncomfortable leaving because they were in the hallway and like thanking us as we left. And I'm just like, okay, this is really, this is uncomfortable. I need to exit as fast as possible. Um, because I, I did what I was supposed to do. I don't feel like I need to be thanked. You're happy with the outcome, but I don't, that's not why you should thank me, you know? So, yeah, I think that was, that was the, the, the biggest thing was like procedural. Don't go in the room. Definitely take a book. I was surprised how many people, I mean, everybody pulls their phone out. Right. But like how many, take a snack. They let take, you keep your phone. They let me keep my phone as long as it was off. Um, well, actually they just said like, make it silent. I turned mine off completely so that there was not going to be an issue. Um, I had water with me. I had snacks with me. Like I was surprised how many people did not bring those things with them. So, but so, even in a case like this, where you came to a fairly clear conclusion early, the actual trial process took an emotional toll. Oh yeah. Yeah. Because again, I was checking in with myself because I didn't want to make a decision based on what I really desperately wanted the decision to be. I wanted to make a decision based on what the facts reveal. And because if you are going to convict someone, that means you have to admit that a human being is capable of a heinous act. And that's, that's tough to grapple with just as a human to accept that like someone could be capable of something horrible. So that's, that is really, I wanted to make sure that I didn't let that kind of bias color my decision and only consider the facts. So yeah, it was, um, it was a lot. And maybe I made the, made more of it than I should have. Um, but I know in talking to the jury, we were talking about like, have you watched any good movies? And I said, oh, well, lately I'm just going home and watching garbage because I am drained. And several of them were nodding. They were like, absolutely, that's what I've been doing. So I know that for them too, this was a this was a weighty, a weighty thing. Well, and, and you're watching videos of killings and you know that your decision is going to change the lives of a lot of people in that courtroom. I get that. I get that. And I think it's a lot that we ask of our jurors to go through this process. And all while you're paying for parking and lunch and <laughs> not getting a lot of compensation, I don't think, right? What 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 did what did the county pay you for this process? Okay, well, the county is still paying COVID pricing for the week I was there. So it is $55 a day. But the next week they were going back to pre-COVID pricing, so it was only $45 a day. Oh, COVID pricing is the premium price. Oh, yes. Yes. And I, um, and I paid $10 a day to park. Well, so that's, 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 you're making bank on jury duty folks, <laughs> but certainly thank you for your service. And I said in my community message, when you were called for jury duty, that I was very happy that someone like you was on a jury. I was just upset that it had to be you. So thank you for doing that. Finally, how do you think that your experience will impact your perspective on the justice system, law, law enforcement, or on what I do in real life or on YouTube? <laughs> um, I, uh, I already said that I'm really encouraged. I mean, I think sometimes we think juries get it wrong. I'm really encouraged that this jury easily came to what I really believe was the right decision. And, um, and I think is proven out by 12 strangers coming to the same conclusion. And that was encouraging. It was, it was, uh, I, I'm also, um, I'm also heartened to see it from this side, right? We, 
we can watch it on YouTube or you can watch it in television or whatever. But to see it from this side that the jury instructions are so very, very specific and that a lot of time is taken to say this, this is the burden that must be met. And these are the criteria for meeting that burden. Um, it's spelled out in black and white. We don't have to go in there and guess and say, well, I think it is, or I think it's not like we have guidelines to follow. And that was, I, I know, like I've heard them when I watch cases with you or, or, you know, we're discussing cases and jury instruction, but like to be up to experience it and to experience what the jury is doing. That was real. That was also really encouraging. Like, Hey, this, this is a system that works for a reason. And this is one of the reasons. Um, I, so that, that was, that was encouraging as well. So I would just say to people, you know, when you get, yes, it's a horrible inconvenience to have to go to jury duty. Um, but it can also be very enlightening and it is an important part of what we do and what we have in this country. Not every country has this kind of system. Not everybody has this way of being able to settle things. And so um, it is both an inconvenience and a privilege to be able to participate in that way. And um, also it's really, really interesting. So, I mean, now I have a really good story to tell, but also to see the, the process of things and there, the defense attorney the judge described him as afterwards, the judge came and talked to us for a few minutes and he described him as an old lion who's been around forever. And he, you could tell like probably in his heyday was like, he's older now, but probably in his heyday was a really amazing, like just to, it was, it, not all attorneys are very good at this, right? We've watched a lot of lousy cross examinations or, or, you know, uh, witness testimonies, but it was really, it was really, can I say the word cool about a, a murder trial? It was really cool to see him carefully lead the witness through, not lead the witness, but lead through the, the information, right? Work his way through the questions <laughs> to get to the resolution he wanted. And, and, uh, he, he did a really good job. That was, uh, it was, it was impressive to watch and, and that was pretty cool. Um, that was like probably the best like lawyer delivery of the, of the case. And, and so that was, that was really interesting, but yeah, I, I am encouraged. And I did, I did like this judge, not that that had anything to do with the decision. He kept, he did keep things even though he's a 2 p.m. lunch taker, he did keep things moving. It was very clear when he was frustrated that we were belaboring a point. Um, I think he wanted to to get this get this over with. Not not over with. Like I'm done and I don't want to be here. But kind of like the evidence is pretty clear. Let's move along. Um, I think was kind of his attitude, and and he really did want to. He didn't want to waste anybody's time. Um, and, and belabor something that was going to be pretty obvious. Uh, so, you know, as far as how the courtroom ran, I thought that was, that was also encouraging, like everything. And everyone is trying to, I, when you're sitting there watching them argue things or object to things, et cetera, and, um, they took great care to be following the law, right? Like they're doing their job. They're trying to, I'm expressing this terribly. They're trying, they, you could see that there was great care for the job they needed to do and the boxes they needed to check and the things they needed to cover and what was important as it pertained to the law. Even if it didn't always make sense to the jury, right? Why am I talking to the coroner? I can see that this person is deceased, but that was part of the law. And, and so all they checked all those boxes, right? They were working through all those boxes. And then at one point the defense could not get, or the prosecutor could not get their video to play. And so the defense is like, Oh, we have it. It's the same video that's been admitted with a, it just has a timestamp on the top. Would you like to use ours there? It was a very, 
while we are opposed, we are also all here uh, to serve the truth. And so there was there was that sort of camaraderie, I guess, that that sort of support for each other that we are all here for the truth. So I feel very encouraged after after being there. And um, it give it gives me hope because sometimes I think I get a little cynical about America, about justice, about our legal system, about the way anything works in this country. And so um, I think that's uh, my perspective has been shifted a little bit. I think it's easy to be cynical. I think I think there's a lot of reasons to be judgmental about things in the world. And I'm very glad to hear that it was overall a positive experience for you. I think that folks tend to watch celebrity trials or whatever they're watching on YouTube or the internet and think, how could 12 randoms come up with a good solution to these various difficult things? And I think it is nice to hear that people take their job seriously. They aren't otherwise discussing things out of the room, even if there aren't obvious penalties or known ways that they could get in trouble for it because they take this seriously, because it is a grave task to decide whether someone should be locked in a cage for a number of years or worse, depending on what trial is before you. So I think you said it well. I think you're too hard on yourself there, but I really want to thank you for spending this time with me and for hopefully informing and educating folks about what that jury process is like, because I, as a lawyer, and certainly one that's on YouTube, is very unlikely to experience this personally. So thank you very much, honey. I really appreciate your time. And thank you for all of the answers. Now, folks, if you do want to talk to Mrs. Hoaglaw or me in the comments to this video, please do leave a comment or question. I can't promise we'll get to them all, but we will certainly take a look at those and try to get to what we can. Uh, and I'm sure that my wife will take a look at some of those as well. Please do that. And otherwise, if you want to support conversations like this one on the internet, please do consider checking out our player or our Patreon to support the channel. Memberships and Super Chats on live streams are also appreciated. And we are very thankful for each and every one of you in the community. Thank you so much yes. for being here. And thank you again, honey, for giving us this talk. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.